So as for the first video, a very short introduction here for the second part. So the After Thoughts edition on the Buckle Bell Aria Prima was cut in three because it was too long. First part was about the 16th century chapel in which we recorded this piece. It will be linked here in the video. So if you haven't watched that part, you can click on that and go to that video first. Thank this you. part will be on uh, the fretted clavichord. I share with you some aspects, what's the difference between a fretted clavichord and an unfretted clavichord. Having said this, things went wrong in this After Thoughts edition. You will notice that my second camera was somehow not recording or the file was lost, which is very surprising because the saint to which this uh, chapel is dedicated, Saint Antonius, is the saint you go to if you have lost things. So I wonder if it was to his uh, work that we lost the file of the handheld camera. Anyway, that means that some details are lost, but I've tried to uh, recover that by zooming in the first camera. So I hope you enjoy. And if you haven't been around and in the clavichord world for a long time, maybe it is your first introduction to a fretted clavichord, which might be interesting overall. Thanks for watching. So here I am again in front of the uh, little clavichord, triple fretted clavichord. It's a copy made by Christopher Clark. I have a second camera and I will handhold this camera and film some footage when I'm talking, while I'm talking. So there you have the nameplate Christopher Clark, 1978. And it is bought by Patrick Colocolo, which is a Brussels organ builder, famous organ builder. Patrick, I think, made more than 120 new organs, which is quite a lot. And he's a good friend of mine. We have some projects in which we collaborate together and uh, have always nice chats. So this instrument is, has quite some age, almost 40 years, and it's copied by an instrument that is present in the Russell collection. And I will just briefly introduce also the uh, viewers that are not so familiar with clavichords in general. You know, I'm playing on an unfretted clavichord and this is a fretted clavichord. So a wonderful uh, occasion also to show to you what the differences are and what the limitations are of the fretted clavichords. And let's start with that. So a fretted instrument, and I will show you with this camera, is a clavichord that shares where a single pair of strings share multiple tangents. So here you have three tangents, actually, on the same pair of strings. So that means, let's see which, which tone that is, it's C sharp. If I hold C sharp, these two are silent. I can play, but you actually get the C sharp, because the C sharp determines the length of the string from the tangent until the bridge, like that. Don't worry about the sound, that's, that are the Belgian fighters training exercise. So, that means that once you hold the C sharp, it's impossible to play the C or the B. So it's triple fretted, if you go up, you have the D, D sharp and E, again, sharing the same pair of strings. Then you have F again. Okay, going to the bass, of course, from triple fretted, it goes to uh, double fretted, and even in the lowest notes, it's free, which means that every um, pair of, st of strings only has one tangent. So the C has one, the D, the E, the A also. The B flat also, not the B flat even shares, is fretted. So that means that the literature you can play on this instrument is of course limited, because once a composer writes a piece in which he, for instance, wants to have this C sharp and this C at the same time, which doesn't make sense in that time, but let's say the B. That's not possible, it will never sound, Unle unless you go from down to up, but then 
this will happen. So that's, that's not meant to be like that. So the literature is limit, limited to 17th century literature. You can play, of course, 18th century literature on that. Uh, and this instrument was built also in this kind of instruments were built in the 18th century. You have you had uh, multiple forms. Not all instruments were triple fretted. You have double fretted instruments, so the, which would increase the possibility, so to say. But uh, in generally spoken, generally spoken. Uh, you have to know in which way your instrument is fretted because sometimes you have to adapt. Even for the swirling, I have to I had to release some notes which were not playable otherwise. And certainly in the buckle bell, actually in the first aria, it, it's okay. It's only one or two places in which this instrument um, has uh, fretted uh, string where I needed to uh, release the key in order to play the second note. So I think two places. So on Pachelbel, we could we could uh, share a story on this aria uh, on the hexachordum Apollinis. Uh, this aria, very short. This aria is uh, suited to play on this instrument. It's a mean tone, quarter tone mean tone. Uh, and the more you advance, the more, the more you go to the sixth uh, variation in this hexachordum set, it's getting more and more modern. So the aria Sebaldina, which we did recently, is impossible to play on this instrument, if only for temperaments. So speaking on temperament, the, the tangents are placed, and will again show you, and sometimes in a very awkward way, and if you're not familiar with, with that, you could think that there's something wrong with the instrument, but it's actually not the case. You can easily imagine if I tell you that the tangents are placed in a position that they have an as, an, an as exact position as possible to uh, create the pitch that is desired. So, for instance, the B flat needs to be on that position and the A needs to be on that position of the string so the B flat is really bending away from its, mid from its middle point therefore hitting the string on the place where in that temperament, meet on temperament here um, gives that B flat the B flat that, that you want to have so there is not so much possible with tuning and even um, like a fretted, unfretted instrument where every pair of strings has its own tangent. Here on a fretted instrument, it's sometimes a compromise uh, to just give a little bit more to one note and giving a little bit less to the other note. So finding uh, the spot in between, so the really dry uh, spot on tuning is not always possible on an instrument like this. And I'm really talking now on this copy, which is very, very nice copy and again 1978 is remarkable so if we continue then you see also the keys the keyboard has a very awkward uh, shape keys really going that way so that of course has all also to do with the tuning and the temperament so it's really a puzzle actually in one way or another the keyboard of such unfret such fretted clavichords that's really very difficult to make. You can imagine that this, the wood of these keys should be really, really, really good because if something happens in humidity and things start to move, then of course uh, the instrument will not function anymore. So they're not easy to make. Then the soundboard is of course much smaller than my instrument, for instance, and that has also to do with the fact that you have less strings, which of course is obvious if you know that multiple tangents share the same string. So the more tangents share the same string, the less strings you have. Meaning that the soundboard is smaller actually, giving a, a different sound than the unfretted clavichord. The unfretted clavichord is, is completely the other world. The fretted clavichord has a more intimate sound. Um, it's maybe a little bit more related to uh, lute music or instruments, that kind of, of, of uh, sound. Um, whereas the fretted clavichord, unfretted clavichord, so instruments like I'm playing, 
actually you could say it's more concert-like instrument really for uh, giving access to more people uh, filling a larger room easily more easily than instruments like this however having said that here in this chapel where I'm standing here and I will, I will share uh, you the cube Anya was standing on the balcony of the gallery and had really no problem in uh, there she is by the way really no problem in hearing this instrument so another typical thing if you're not familiar with these older types of instruments is that in the bass octave you will not have a full octave you have a short octave which means that you stop at C on the place where you normally would expect the uh, E and the F sharp is D the G sharp is E then you have F, G, A B flat is in the normal position as is the F and the G then you have B and then C so which is uh, very awkward in the beginning if you're not used to do that However, having said that, music like Zwilling, um, Zwilling only knew this kind of short octaves, so he composed explicitly for that. And if you take care of the fingering, you will see that it fits very well. So, for the rest, um, the, this instrument has a remarkable, beautiful finish. So that, again, the stories you sometimes hear, and actually too often hear, I was filming, that clavichords were cheap practice instruments just to give access to uh, simple, easy practice instruments. Um, that's not true. It, it's, it's, it's true in a sense that it is a part of the truth, but this clavichord is not a cheap instrument, I can tell you. It's really beautiful made, beautifully made, also with the keys. So there is a lot, really, and I mean what I say, a lot to be discovered. And discovered maybe not, but put in the right in the right context. Uh, clavichords, they share one thing, have shown some, one thing in common that they are really underestimated today. And maybe the unfretted ones the most. But that's topic for another video. What's really nice of this instrument is the somehow sweet attack in the travel. Uh, it's really direct. 